Does free labor, free labor ever really gain the same traction in the South, though, that it had in the North? That's something I was, it seems like there's some tension around, around that subject in your book. Well, that depends on what you think. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I should, maybe I should begin by saying historians disagree yeah. on that. But I guess you can say that about almost any question, right? Um, is sharecropping a form of free labor? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of debate. My good colleague, Professor Barbara Field, says, absolutely. You had a transition from slave labor to free labor. This is the form free labor took in the South. It is not slavery. Um, you have to, it's capitalist free labor. Others say, no, no, no. Sharecroppers are in a very unusual situation there. They don't have the mobility that um, uh, normal free laborers have. They're often burdened with debt, et cetera. So, um, Free labor takes different forms in the South. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think sharecropping is a form of free labor. In other words, is free labor only one thing? Mm -hmm. Is there only one mode of free labor that we can identify as such? And I think probably not. Um, depends what you're comparing it with. If you're comparing it with slavery, it's certainly not slavery. If you're comparing it with a kind of idealized notion of the northern laborer who can sh move from job to job and move up the social scale, it's not that either. Mm -hmm. This raises a question, which you mentioned this general subject in class about this recent turn in historiography among scholars who are trying to move beyond freedom. They say that this is, uh, the, the, their line would be that this is a paradigm that was useful in its time, but we're running into limitations and we need to bring up new ways of orienting our scholarship around equality, maybe around just the struggle for a survival, all sorts of different candidates. So maybe as a way of getting into that subject, I'd just like to hear from you what difference did emancipation make for, like, let's say the life of a recent, how is life for an African-American person, former slave in the South in 1865 different than, say, 1885? From 1865 to, to 1885. Or 1863 to uh, Yeah, okay, no, I'm saying, so you're not, I mean, it's much easier to say how is it different from slavery. Okay. In, Let's take that, like 1855 to right, 1885. Right, and, and obviously there are as many, many, many aspects of life of slavery which no longer exist mm -hmm. after the Civil War. People cannot be bought and sold. Mm -hmm. They have far more autonomy, not total autonomy, far more autonomy in allocating their own labor, their labor, their own families. Uh, they do have physical mobility, contrary to what a lot of scholars write. They, they, they are not tied to the land mm -hmm. in, in, in the way a serf might be in, in Russia after emancipation. Um, they have all sorts of aspirations and community institutions that mm -hmm. couldn't have existed. So in other words, all right, you, uh, you, nobody who was a slave ever said, it's too bad we got rid of slavery, despite all the, the, the disappointments which came later. But I think given the tremendous hopes and uh, aspirations that were put into the notion of freedom, Certainly by the 1880s, there's a severe sense of disappointment. And then by the 1890s, even greater sense of disappointment. And if you go to the WPA slave narratives down in the 1930s, which of course are very elderly people being interviewed, but they often say, we were promised a lot we didn't get. Yeah. The promises the government made to us were broken, whether it was land or political equality or citizenship rights. So there is a deep sense of betrayal which lasts as long as that generation lasts, which is into the late 1930s or so. Um, I think, uh, you know, freedom, again, has been something very central to my writing, and I'm not claiming it is the only ideal that one should elaborate in this. Equality certainly will take you down certain other directions. Um, Self-determination, maybe, is mm -hmm. another aspect of this. If you read Stephen Hahn's work, emphasizes that a great deal. But my feeling is this, in the United States, freedom is so central to our political vocabulary mm -hmm. over the course of our history, from the Declaration of Independence on down, that all, well, many of these other ideals get absorbed into people's concepts of freedom. In this country, when people are talking about freedom, they're often talking about something else, actually. Mm -hmm. But it gets absorbed into the notion. So freedom is a very capacious ideal which can encompass many of these other categories that people are talking about. You know, you know very well, Sir Isaiah Berlin wrote this famous essay, Two Concepts of Freedom, mm -hmm. Positive and Negative. And um, then there was criticism of it by philosophers and others saying, you know, his, his privileging of negative freedom uh, as the freedom from restraint, you know, it, it kind of is a very thin notion of freedom yeah. and it doesn't, 
encompass any struggles, group struggles for greater rights and Well, equality. the lines always get blurry, and sometimes it seems like there's more, sometimes they collapse into each other. It's very right. hard to draw those lines. But in a, in a subsequent, this is only a real scholar, you know, in a subsequent edition, in a footnote, <laughs> Berlin tried to answer these critics, and he said, you know, freedom is not the only ideal. Mm -hmm. I believe in all these other things that people are complaining about, but they're not freedom. Mm -hmm. They are, if you're talking about equality, talk about equality. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about freedom. I mean, because he said freedom is negative. It's lack of outside restraint. Um, but that's not equality. But so let's talk about equality. And that may even require some limitation on people's freedoms. But at least we should be explicit about that. So he said, let's not expand freedom to be such a broad term that encompasses everything. I'm going away, away from your subject. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think the more, <laughs> what can I say? The more lights, the more laser beam lights that people shine into this area, this uh, period, the better. Mm -hmm. So if, but since freedom is achieved, even though limited, that gives you a slightly different take on the period than let us say if you emphasize equality, mm -hmm. which will certainly lead you to a sense of deep disappointment. Something that's often paired with freedom in these discussions as you have, there's focus on freedom and that comes with a focus on citizenship and inclusion in the American polity. And as a way of getting to that subject, I wonder if, if you were writing history of black nationalism in this period, what evidence do you think you would find from the Reconstruction South? Well, you would read uh, Stephen Hahn's yeah. book, uh, A Nation Under Our Feet. Yeah. He uses the very word nation in the title to emphasize this idea that, um, that African Americans thought of themselves not simply as individual citizens, although certainly they demanded those rights, but as members of a people or a nation with group aspirations and demanding group rights, et cetera, and group self-determination. So um, that's where you would go. I would, I mean, I, you know, I don't, 100% agree with Han. Yeah, it seems like there's some tension. He certainly seems to think that he's arguing with you. Well, he, he is to the extent that I'm, the emphasis of my book is on inclusion, the struggle for inclusion in the polity, in the uh, uh, nation. And his emphasis, we're, we're not talking about 100% one way or the other. We're talking about where the emphasis lies. And in his book, the emphasis is more on self-determination, not so much inclusion. Um, I think, that, you know, I, I think that's how the writing of history moves forward, with people coming up with different perspectives and looking at, you know, and examining them and seeing where they go. He's very interested in emigration movements, mm -hmm. both within the United States, such as after Reconstruction to Kansas and other places, and maybe even to Africa or other such places. I'm impressed by the weakness of such movements during the Reconstruction period, although they emerge again radically after, you know, in the strength after the Reconstruction period. Um, Hans' book's a very important book. Uh, if there's a diff slight difference of emphasis in our, in our books, that's fine. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how you learn about history. But I think my feeling, though, is in high Reconstruction, in the period of what we call radical Reconstruction, mm -hmm. the r emphasis of most African Americans is on gaining rights as citizens of the United States. Mm -hmm and not a national separatist kind of self-determination, which will emerge, I think, more powerfully after the end of Reconstruction when the avenue of inclusion seems to be more and more closed off.